Or it's not like this. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Word referring to Jesus. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made, and without Him nothing was made that's been made. That's talking about Jesus as God in the beginning. In Him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The life of the Word was, no, is the light of all mankind. Is. It's a light unto our feet and a light unto our, and a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. And that means the lamp unto our feet that shows us where we are now and a lamp unto our path or whichever way that goes shows us where we're going. That's an awesome thing. Both where we are and where we're going. That verse doesn't contain anything about where we've been. We need to remember where we've been what he set us free from, what he brought us out from, what he healed us from. But that verse shows where we are and where we're going. Where we're going. John 1, 14. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory. The glory of the one and only son who came from the father, full of grace and of truth. It was necessary... For the Son of God to be made lower than the angels, to take on human form with all of its limitations, its needs, and its pains. It was necessary for the Holy Lamb of God to come into the world and become the perfect sacrifice. When I say it was necessary, he didn't have to do that. He chose to do that because of his love for you and me. So it was necessary on our part. It was necessary for us. Because he was the only one who could do it. He was the only one that was a spotless lamb. He was the only one that lived a perfect sinless life. He was the only one whose blood could set us free from the law of sin and death. He was the only one who could satisfy the requirement for that ultra, ultimate sacrifice. The sacrifice that would set us free. And in verse 18, it says, No one has ever seen God, but the one and only Son, who is himself God and is in closest relations with the Father, has been, has made him known. So we relate to the Father through Jesus, the Son, the Word, because for a while he had human form. For 33 years he had a human form. He came here to fulfill what was written about him in prophecy. All the Old Testament, all the Old Testament, every book has some view of his coming, some word or message about, about the Messiah, the Savior. But the clearest picture is in Isaiah chapter 53. Do you know that... It, the Jewish people aren't to read that chapter. Did you know that? Because it depicts Jesus as a suffering Savior instead of the conquering Messiah that they're looking for. Isaiah 53. Who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. Nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind. A man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hide their faces. He was despised and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took up our pain and bore our sufferings. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him, and afflicted. Verse 5, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds we are healed. That's what they did. That's what happened. He was pierced. Not for any wrongdoing he ever did. Pilate declared him innocent. But for our transgressions, for our sins, for my sins. 
Verse 6, we all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He took upon himself the sins of everyone that would ever live. To the cross. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent. So he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. Yet who of this generation, his generation, protested? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgressions of my people he was punished. He was assigned a grave with the wicked, and with him and with the rich in his death. Though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth, yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his offspring and prolong his days, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After he has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied by his knowing, my righteous servant will justify many and will bear their iniquities. That was written hundreds of years before it happened. And it spells out what Jesus did and why he did it. It spells it out so clearly. Therefore I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils among the strong, because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors, one on each side. For he bore the sins of many and made intercession for the transgressions. The crucifixion, he was arrested, he was tried, he was tortured. He was bound over to be crucified. John 19, 30 says, When he had received the drink, Jesus said, It is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. He gave it up. He said, No one takes my life from me. I'm going to give it. I'm going to give it. I'm going to give it. It is finished. The, the old is done. The old contract, the old deal is over. I have paid the price. I've paid the debt. It's all over. You don't need to sacrifice the blood of animals anymore because his sacrifice was over. Mark 15, 37 to 39, with a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. With a loud cry, the, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from the top to the bottom. And when the centurion who stood there in front of Jesus saw how he died, he said, surely this man was the son of God. The score was settled. The price was paid. The old deal was done. The blood of rams and goats was no longer necessary. The curtain that had separated common people from God was torn in half. Before that, people couldn't approach God. Only the priest and once a year could go behind that curtain and only if he was carrying blood. And they would tie a rope around his ankle in case he was in a state of sin and he would be struck dead before the Ark of the Covenant. And they would drag him out from under the curtain. <laughs> that stuff isn't necessary anymore. That curtain was torn in two. Now Jesus is our high priest and we could go directly directly to God. The blood of Jesus flowed freely from his body on the cross. And that means his life ebbed away. His life. The debt was paid. No further sacrifices ever needed. Ever. He took our sins upon himself on the cross. I was represented on the cross by my sins. And so have you, and so were you. My sin was there. He took my sin with him under the cross. I was represented. 
The cross is a pivotal moment in all of human history. When Jesus said it, it is finished, the ultimate sacrifice had been made, the old order of things, the old requirements of animal blood and the priesthood itself were no longer necessary. Once and for all, the debt was paid. The only thing that remained was for Jesus to prove that he was who he said he was. Because when they saw him die, they took him down from the cross and put him in a tomb. Put a stone on him. And they thought it was over. And we can look back and say, ha, 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 ha. No, it wasn't. But at that moment, he was gone. So he had to prove who he said he was, John 20, 1 to 10. There are, different, there are four different accounts of this, but in this one of, in John, it says, Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. She wasn't the only one that went there. She's just the one that he's talking about. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. Now when he says the other disciple, John, he's talking about himself. When he says the one Jesus loved, he's boasting a little bit here. And he continues to boast. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple, John, outran Peter and reached the tomb first. So he wants us to know that he's a faster runner <laughs> than Peter. He bent over and looked into the, into the tomb with the strips of linen lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple, talking about himself again, who had reached the tomb first, also went inside. He saw and believed. They, did, they still didn't understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to where they were staying. The resurrection was the proof, the ultimate proof that Jesus was the Messiah. They were looking for a military leader in the order of David to conquer the Romans and kick them out of their homeland. But he proved that he was the Messiah, the suffering Savior of Isaiah 53. No one could raise his own self from the dead. Lazarus came out of the grave, but only at the order of Jesus. And he came out with the grave cloth still on him. Jesus took, out, took off his own grave cloth. Lazarus, he was already bound up in the cloth of death and came hopping out of the grave because Jesus said, take off the grave clothes and let him go. Lazarus had to be set free from someone else, by someone else. Jesus set his own self free. He came forth on his own power. He showed himself to those whom he wished to show himself. His death was public for all to see, his death, but his resurrection was private. His appearances after the resurrection were limited. Room was left for doubt. Our salvation depends on faith. God left room for those who would refuse to believe. He requires us to come to him in faith. If he'd have demonstrated his power to everybody in Jerusalem and all around there, then they would have come to him in knowledge and not in faith. So he just appeared to certain ones. His death was public. The resurrection was private. Interesting point. 
and we are led into it. We are the ones that know about it. Yeah. And anyone else who cares to, to search it in the Bible. Amen. So this account observed that it only names Mary Magdalene. In Matthew, there are two Marys. In Mark, <clears throat> there are two Marys. In Luke, it says the women. There's no conflict in the Gospels. John only names Mary Magdalene. He's just speaking of her, but that doesn't mean the other women weren't there. He only names Mary Magdalene. The point is that women went to the grave to do the anointing, to prepare the burial of Jesus. They were expecting to find a corpse. And the corpses needed to be anointed and wrapped with spices. And there was a, a thing that they went through, the, a customary burial preparation for the body of Jesus. Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea claimed the body and hurriedly placed it in the tomb without the necessary preparation, without the spices and so forth. Time was of the essence because this was... He was already dead. And so they wanted to get this done before corruption set into his body. Then came early morning. At first light, the women were determined to do this last act of kindness for their master. They had beheld him dead, a lifeless corpse. But they were still dedicated to him, like we all are when we have a death of a loved one or a funeral, we're still dedicated to that person. The horrible scene of his death, and it was horrible on the cross, did not dissuade them from intending to tenderly pre prepare for burial. Surprise! <laughs> Apparently they didn't expect him to be resurrected. I mean, would you expect that? He was mangled when they last saw him. They expected to find a lifeless body, a bloody corpse, a punctured body, holes in his hands and feet, spear hole on its side. That's what they're expecting to see. The account in Luke going to just skip through it a little bit here on the first day of the week and he's talking about, he says the women took spices they had prepared went to the tomb found the stone rolled away from the tomb but when they entered they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus and I'm going to skip down here in the interest of time but The women bowed to the, with their faces to the ground. Um, two, two men in clothes gleamed like lightning and stood beside them. Said they were frightened. They bowed their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He's not here. He's risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee, the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified on the third day, be raised again. Then they remembered his words. So they told all these things to the eleven and to all the other disciples that were there. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the others with them who told this to the apostles. But they wouldn't believe the women. How many times have you told somebody about Jesus and they refuse to believe? They wouldn't believe it. These were their friends, their fellow disciples. Mary Magdalene was held in high honor. They wouldn't believe it. Why? Because they saw the lifeless, bloody corpse. They believed what they saw instead of what they heard. And then 
on the road to Emmaus. Two disciples were walking along talking about what happened. And Jesus came up and started walking with them, but they were kept from knowing, from recognizing him. And then they said about the, you know, about the crucifixion and, the, and the, now they say he's risen. And he explained to them from scripture what was to happen. And when he got there, uh, when they got to Emmaus, they said, come and eat with us. And he went into the room where they were and he blessed the food and then he disappeared right through the door. And then their eyes were opened and they knew that it was him. They knew. And then they said this. Did not our hearts burn within us as he talked with us along the way? I preach a sermon called The Burning Heart on the road to Emmaus. Did not our hearts burn within us? Gospel heartburn. You ever experienced gospel heartburn? We serve a risen Savior. He's worthy to receive our praise. Not only because he is God and he was God and he was with God in the beginning. Because he came here to set us free with his own blood shed on the cruel cross of Calvary. That's why we serve him. And that's why he is worthy of our praise. Amen. So we praise him. We shout hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Glory to God. How great you are. How wonderful you are. If it wasn't for the cross, we wouldn't be able to survive in eternity. It would be all over. He suffered so we wouldn't have to suffer eternity. It only remains for us to believe and receive him as Lord and Savior. John 1, 12. To as many as received him, even to those that believed in his name, he gave the power to become children of God. He suffered so you wouldn't have to. He is to be worshipped. Our very life should be constructed to praise and honor our Lord and Savior. On Easter, we celebrate what he did. We celebrate his death and resurrection. Good Friday, we think about his torment and his death on the cross. And Easter Sunday, we celebrate that he came out of the grave, said, did, proved that he was who he said he was. It's a good time for us to think about where we are in God. To think about whether we've been living the way God wants us to live. To be introspective. Do I worship him? Do I talk to him? How can you have a savior and not speak to him? <laughs> How can you do that? He expects you to speak to him. All the time. It's called prayer. <laughs> We serve a risen Savior. The most unique thing that ever happened in all of history. Or, and ever will happen in all of history. And someday, when we're called to cross that river, we'll look into his eyes. Which burn with fire of love for the believers. We'll see his nail-scarred hands. It's the only man-made thing in heaven. Nail-scarred hands. We'll know him. We'll know his love. And he knows us when we get there. The important question is, will you get there? That's the important question. Have you received him as your Lord and Savior? As I look across here, I, I know most of you, probably all of you. And I believe that you're all born again believers. But if anyone's struggling with that, you come and see me right after. And I'll talk to you about it and lead you to it. I will. At the conclusion, I will need two volunteers. They could be little ones. And in my office back there, there are there's a box and a and a basket full of Easter candy. So I need two assistants to go back there and stand at the doors and well, I'll 
people to have candy when they go out. So I need two assistants to uh, to go and do that. You volunteered somebody. <laughs> Can he? Is he big enough to hold up hold that box up? Anyway, I need just need two people to go and do that at the conclusion, which is pretty soon. Lord, we thank you today for. Oh, Lord, our awesome, awesome Savior and the awesome things you did for us, Lord God. How awesome you are, how beautiful you are, how holy you are, how strong you are, how perfect you are. And yet you loved us, imperfect sinners, enough to suffer and die on the cross of Calvary. And now because we've been washed clean, we can expect to see you in eternity and live with you. We get to move in with you, Lord. It's an awesome thought. So go with everyone today. Help us to keep you in our hearts, even during this whole week. Bless your people. And keep us all safe till we meet again. In Jesus' name, amen. Blessings to all of you on Resurrection Sunday. I need two kids to go in my office and get the candy and hold it at the door before anyone is... is